In the last video, I tracked the alignment from the Fernando de Noronha Islands of Brazil, just off the coast near Natal, and the location of what were at least 10 star forts at one time, to the islands of Trindade and Martin Vaz, also part of Brazil, but located 680 miles or 1,100 kilometers from the coast, to the islands of Tristan da Cunha, a British overseas territory, and the location of the world's most isolated settlement, with ship or boat being the only way to travel in or out. My name is Michelle Gibson. Next on the alignment, we come to the Kerguelen Islands, also known as the Desolation Islands, and administered as part of the French Southern and Antarctic lands, otherwise known as France's Scattered Islands in the Indian Ocean. The French Southern and Antarctic lands have been an overseas territory of France since 1955. They consist of the Kerguelen Islands, volcanic islands in the southern Indian Ocean, southeast of Africa, approximately equidistant between Africa, Antarctica, and Australia, St. Paul and Amsterdam Islands, a group to the north of Kerguelen, and we'll be looking at both of these places in the tracking of this alignment. The Crozet Islands, a group in the southern Indian Ocean, south of Madagascar. Adeliland, the French claim on the continent of Antarctica. Adeliland, and the Adeli penguin for that matter, were named after Adele, the wife of French explorer and naval officer Jules Dumont d'Urville, who explored Antarctica, among other places in the South and West Pacific. And the Scattered Islands, a group of dispersed islands around the coast of Madagascar, of which the principal station is on Tromelin Island. The French Austral lands and seas were inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site on July 5th of 2019. The French Southern and Antarctic lands are administered by a prefect with headquarters in St. Pierre on Réunion Island. I'm going to spend some time looking into the life and voyages of Jules Dumont d'Urville because I believe his story is important to understanding the historical narrative we have been taught. Early in his naval exploration career, as a result of being in the right place at the right time on a naval hydrological survey of the Greek islands in the Aegean Sea, Dumont d'Urville was given the credit and a knighthood in the Legion of Honor for ultimately enabling the famous Venus de Milo marble statue to come from the Greek island of Milos to the Louvre in Paris instead of it going to Constantinople. After he returned from the Aegean Sea expedition, he planned an expedition with another naval officer of the Pacific Ocean, an area France had been forced out of as a result of the Napoleonic Wars. They set out on their expedition to collect scientific and strategic information in August of 1822 on a ship named originally La Coquille and sailed to the Falkland Islands, the coast of Peru and Chile in South America, New Guinea, New Zealand, and Australia. The expedition carried out research in the fields of botany and insects, bringing back thousands of specimens to the Natural History Museum in Paris. Then Dumont d'Urville departed on La Coquille, now called l'Astrolabe, or the Astrolabe, named for a navigational device, and sailed in 1826 for a three-year voyage to New Zealand, Fiji, the Loyalty Islands, New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Caroline Islands, and the Malaccas in eastern Indonesia. In 1837, Dumont d'Urville set out yet again on the Astrolabe for the South Orkney Islands in the Southern Ocean, the Marquesas Islands, Tasmania, along the coast of Antarctica, at which time he claimed land on January 21st of 1840 for France, considered his most significant achievement. He named it Adeli Land after his wife Adele. He also named the Adeli Penguin for his wife. He then sailed on to New Zealand, the Torres Strait, Reunion Island, and St. Helena Island, returning to France later in 1840. 
He was promoted to rear admiral upon his return, and he wrote a report of the expedition, which was published between 1841 and 1854 in 24 volumes. An interesting side note about Dumont d'Urville's life was his death. He and his entire family were killed in the first ever rail disaster in France in May of 1842, called the Versailles Rail Accident, in which the train's locomotive derailed, the wagons rolled, and the coal tender ended up at the front of the train and caught fire. This was said to be a painting of the incident. Remains said to have been identified as his by a doctor who had been on board the Astrolabe with him were interred here at the Montparnasse Cemetery in Paris. Could this be a case of dead men tell no tales, as it were? Like, perhaps, explorer Meriwether Lewis, who had died of gunshot wounds in 1809. Meriwether Lewis had returned from the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1807, was made the governor of Louisiana Territory by Thomas Jefferson, and had made arrangements to publish his Corps of Discovery journals. For a point of information, he was initiated into Freemasonry between 1796 and 1797, from where he was born and raised in Albemarle County, Virginia Colony, shortly after he joined the United States Army in 1795. Being governor of the Louisiana Territory didn't work too well for him, for a variety of reasons, and he set out for Washington, D.C. to address financial issues that had arisen as a result of denied payments of drafts he had drawn against the War Department when he was governor, and he carried with him his journals for delivery to his publisher. He decided to go overland to Washington instead of by a ship by way of New Orleans and stayed for the night at a place called Grinder's Stand, southwest of Nashville, Tennessee. Gunshots were heard in the early morning hours, and he was found with multiple gunshot wounds to the head and gut. We are told that Thomas Jefferson and some historians generally accepted Lewis's death as a suicide. His family never accepted that it was suicide, and the matter is still debated. No one was ever charged with his murder. Just sharing some strange deaths that are out there and easy to find in the historical narrative we have been given. And I'm quite certain there was a correlation between the ancient advanced Washita Empire of North America and the Louisiana Purchase. Also, it is interesting to note there were similar naval expeditions by other countries around the same time as those of Dumont d'Urville for France. The U.S. Exploring Expedition was an exploring and surveying expedition of the Pacific Ocean and the surrounding lands conducted by the United States between 1838 and 1842. The expedition was described as of major importance to the growth of science in the United States, and that during the events of its occurrence, armed conflict between Pacific Islanders and the expedition was common, and dozens of natives were killed, as well as a few Americans. It involved a squadron of four ships, with specialists on each, including naturalist, botanist, a mineralogist, a taxidermist, and a philologist, which is someone who studies written and oral histories. It is sometimes referred to as the USXX, or Wilkes Expedition, after the commanding officer, Navy Lieutenant Charles Wilkes. The ships of the Wilkes Expedition departed from Hampton Roads in Virginia for the first stop in the Madeira Islands off the coast of Africa on August 18, 1838. The routes of the expedition went something like this, all over the place. The squadron of ships pretty much sailed together at different rates of speed from their first stop at Madeira to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of South America, Valparaiso in Chile, Calao in Peru, the islands of Tahiti and Samoa in the South Pacific, Sydney in Australia, Antarctica, which they arrived at and discovered on January 16th of 1840, just mere days before the completely different expedition, question mark, of Dumont d'Urville's claimed land on Antarctica on January 21st of 1840. 
and then returned by way of Fiji to the Sandwich Islands, otherwise known as the Hawaiian Islands, before coming back to the United States. The ships did break off into pairs on occasion to explore different places in the same general locations. Then there were the voyages of the HMS Beagle, originally a Cherokee-class 10-gun boat of the British Royal Navy, said to have set off from the Royal Dockland of Woolwich at the River Thames on May 11th of 1820. The HMS Beagle's first voyage was between 1826 and 1830, accompanying the larger ship HMS Adventure on a hydrologic survey of Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego under the overall command of the Australian Navy Captain Philip Parker King. The second voyage of the HMS Beagle between 1831 and 1832 was joined by naturalist Charles Darwin on a second trip to South America and then around the world. Charles Darwin kept a diary of his experiences and rewrote this as a book titled Journal and Remarks, becoming published in 1839 as The Voyage of the Beagle. The third voyage of the HMS Beagle took place between 1837 and 1843 and was a third surveying voyage to Australia, stopping on the way at Tenerife in the Canary Islands, Salvador on the coast of Brazil in Bahia State, and Cape Town in South Africa. I have found all three of these places on planetary grid alignments. In Australia, the crew surveyed Western Australia, starting in what is now Perth, to the Fitzroy River, then both shores of the Bass Strait in Australia's southeast corner, then north to the shores of the Arafura Sea, across from Timor. Again, all of these places figure prominently on grid alignments. In 1845, the HMS Beagle was refitted as a Coast Guard watch vessel in Essex in the navigable waters beyond the Thames estuary, moored in the middle of the River Roach, until the oyster companies and traders petitioned to have it removed in 1851, citing the vessel was obstructing the river and its oyster beds. The Navy list shows that on May 25th of 1851, the Beagle was renamed South End WV No. 7 at Pagglesham and sold in 1870 to be broken up. Just for point of reference, the Crystal Palace exhibition took place in London's Hyde Park between May 1st of 1851 to October 15th of 1851. I believe the Crystal Palace exhibition of 1851 was the official kickoff to the reset timeline of the New World Order. I believe the history of Earth has been replaced with the history of those that took over and claimed the legacy of the original builders of civilization. And I believe all of these voyages of exploration were part of how they did it. The Earth and all that was in it was surveyed after the mud flood event and before the official start of the New Reset timeline in 1851, from which our new history was based. Back to the Kerguelen Islands, which started this die track off into 19th century exploration history. The Kerguelen Islands themselves are considered an exposed part of the Kerguelen Plateau, which is considered a large igneous province, or an extremely large accumulation of igneous rocks, mostly submerged by the southern Indian Ocean. The main island, known as Grand Terre, is 2,577 square miles, or 6,675 kilometers squared. The islands were officially discovered by the French navigator Yves Joseph de Kerguelen Tremeric on February 12th of 1772. Then apparently the very next day, a member of the same expedition named Charles de Boiscahenac landed on the island and claimed it for the French crown. The island was visited regularly by whalers and sealers after its discovery and between the 18th and 20th century, the region's whales and seals were hunted to the point of near extinction. The islands were not completely surveyed until 1840 during the Ross Expedition, a voyage of scientific exploration of the Antarctic between 1839 and 1843. This is said to be an engraving from the Ross Expedition of Christmas Harbor at Kerguelen Island from an elevation of 600 feet or 183 meters. The main base, or so-called capital of the Kerguelen Islands, is port au Francais, on the eastern shore of Grande Terre. This is considered the best-known feature of the Kerguelen Islands, known as the Arch of Kerguelen, 
at Port Christmas, where there was formerly a geomagnetic station. Apparently, the Arch of Kerguelen actually looked like an arch at one time. Also, what looks to be a version of the same land feature in the Kerguelen Islands, called St. Anne's Finger on the Galliani Peninsula in the Bay La Rose on the top left, is found in the Revilla Gigedo Islands in the Pacific Ocean near the west coast of Mexico and part of its Colima province on the top right. And on the bottom left, a feature found in the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador on the northwestern side of South America. And on the bottom right, one is also found near Yalta on the Crimean Peninsula and the Black Sea. Mount Ross is the highest point of Kerguelen Island at 6,069 feet or 1,850 meters, also on the Galliani Peninsula. Other land features of Kerguelen Island include Mounts Simone and Diane. George Biddle Airy of Great Britain's Royal Observatory organized and equipped five expeditions to different parts of the world, of which three were sent to Kerguelen Island, to observe the 1874 transit of Venus. Between 1874 and 1875, altogether British, German, and United States expeditions visited Kerguelen to observe the transit of Venus. The 1874 transit of Venus took place on December 9th of that year and was the first of the pair of Venus transits, which took place in the 19th century, the second one being in 1882. A transit of Venus takes place across the Sun when the planet Venus passes directly between the Sun and a superior planet, becoming visible against the solar disk. Interestingly, this is a diagram of the orbit of Venus as seen from Earth. There is a geomagnetic station at Cap Rotmanoff in the present day, the easternmost point of the Kerguelen Islands. So even today, the principal activities on the islands focus on scientific research, mostly Earth sciences and biology, as well as a French satellite and rocket tracking, lodging, and station near Port au Francais. And a small fleet of fishing vessels that are owned out of Reunion Island and licensed to fish in this exclusive economic zone. Next on the alignment, we come to Ile Saint Paul or Saint Paul Island. Part of the French Southern and Antarctic lands mentioned previously. We are told in 1780, the thin stretch of rock that used to close off the crater active volcano it sits on top of collapsed, admitting water through a 330 foot or 100 meter channel. The entrance is shallow, allowing only small ships and boats to enter. For comparison and appearance, on the left is the entrance to what is called the Bassin du Crater, or Loch Crater, or an English crater lake on the St. Paul Island in the South Indian Ocean, compared with what is found on the Hawaiian island of Molokai in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. While the Portuguese were first credited with discovering the island in 1559, and the Dutch was sighting it in 1618. The French laid claim to it in 1842, apparently when a group of fishermen from Reunion Island that were interested in setting up a fishery on St. Paul pressed the governor of Reunion to take possession of it, as well as Amsterdam Island, which we will be coming to next on the alignment. Apparently he did so by official decree. On June 8th of 1843, all fishery activities were abandoned in 1853, however, when the French government renounced its possession of the two islands. The HMS Magera, a British troop transport, was wrecked on the Ile St. Paul in 1871, and it took approximately three months to rescue all 400 persons that were on board. 
This was said to be a print of the Ile St. Paul from that time period in 1871. Then, in 1892, the crew of the French ship Bourdonnais again took possession for the French government of St. Paul and Amsterdam Islands. These days, the main human activity on St. Paul is a research cabin used for scientific or ecological short campaigns only, and no permanent human population. Other activity involves its importance as a seabird breeding site. The next place we come to on the alignment I am tracking is the Ile Amsterdam, or Amsterdam Island, another one of the French southern and Antarctic lands claimed by France in 1892. Amsterdam Island is roughly equidistant from the land masses of Madagascar, Australia, and Antarctica. While a Spanish explorer by the name of Juan Sebastian de Elcano was said to have sighted the island in 1522, when he was completing the first circumnavigation of the world after Magellan's death in the Philippines in 1522. Amsterdam Island was said to have gotten its name over a hundred years later. In 1633, from a Dutch sea captain, Anthony Van Diemen, who named it after his ship, New Amsterdam, which was named after the Dutch settlement of New Amsterdam, which later became New York City. Amsterdam Island was a stop for the McCartney mission in 1793, the first British diplomatic mission to China. The goals of the McCartney mission were to 1. open new ports for British trade in China, 2. the establishment of a permanent embassy in what was then called Peking, now Beijing, 3. the cession of a small island off the coast of China for Britain's use, and 4 the relaxation of trade restrictions on British merchants in Canton in southern China. While it was said to have failed to achieve its initial objectives, the McCartney mission was noted for having brought back extensive cultural, political, and geographical observations that its participants recorded. After having been claimed for France in 1892, the islands were part of the French colony of Madagascar from 1924 until August 6th of 1955 when the French Southern and Antarctic lands were formed. The only settlement on Amsterdam Island is a seasonal research station, which studies biology, meteorology, and geomagnetics. Filica arbora trees grow on Amsterdam Island. It was called the Great Forest at one time, covering the lowlands of the island until most of the trees were cleared by fires set by sealers around 1825. Here is a photograph of lee waves taken on Amsterdam Island. Lee waves are atmospheric stationary waves and a form of internal gravity waves. I also have an 11-part circle alignment series that tracks a long-distance alignment that begins and ends at Amsterdam Island. It definitely seems as though the location of the islands I have been tracking in the Atlantic and South Indian Oceans are in a favorable location with regards to 1. trade winds or the permanent east to west prevailing winds that flow in the Earth's equatorial region between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south and which allowed trade routes to become established across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, making various places on Earth easy or difficult to access, shown on the top, and 2. on the Earth's ocean currents which are like giant conveyor belts flowing through the ocean and moving huge amounts of water all the time, and which look very similar to the depiction of the direction of the trade winds shown on the bottom. Edmund Haley was not only an astronomer, he was a geophysicist, mathematician, meteorologist, and physicist. This is a map he made in 1686 of the Earth's trade winds, Note the place names of his time. The next stop on the alignment I am tracking is Matara, a major commercial hub and city in Sri Lanka's southern province. Matara historically was part of an area that was known as the Kingdom or Principality of Rohana or Ruhunu, one of the three kingdoms of what is known in present day as Sri Lanka and known in the past as Ceylon. 
The Buddhist temple in the middle of town was built by the ancient kings and is on the site of a fig tree sacred to, and protected by, the Buddhists who live here. In the 16th through 18th centuries, Matara was ruled by the Portuguese and Dutch, respectively. The Portuguese rule of Matara was said to have been ruthless, during which time they were said to have plundered and ransacked buildings, storehouses, and shrines. The Dutch were said to have captured Matara from the Portuguese in 1640. There is a section of Matara called Fort between the ocean and the Nilwala River. The Matara Fort was said to have been built by the Portuguese in 1560 and largely rebuilt by the Dutch after they defeated the Portuguese in 1640, an illustration of which is pictured on the left and on the right is all that remains of the Matara Fort today, though it is the location of the administrative center of the entire Matara district. Directly across the Nilwala River from the remains of the Matara Fort is what is actually called Star Fort Matara. The Dutch were said to have built the Star Fort Matara between 1761 and 1765 to protect the main fort from attacks originating from the river. At the top of the entrance to the Star Fort, the VOC symbol of the Dutch East India Company is prominently and permanently engraved. It is far easier to add engravings than build a structure of this nature and size. I typically find Star Forts in pairs and clusters on alignments all over the earth and believe they were not military in nature as we have been taught. I think they functioned as part of the electrical circuitry of the Earth's worldwide grid system. One of the definitions of the word battery is a device that produces electricity that may have several primary or secondary cells arranged in parallel or series, as well as a battery source of energy which provides a push or a voltage of energy to get the current flowing in a circuit. The Matara Clock Tower is situated on the rampart of the Matara Fort in the fort section of Matara and was said to have been built by the Dutch in 1765. This is one of the massive gates of the Matara Fort. What is called the Old Noop Market or Old Dutch Market in Matara was said to have been built by the Dutch in 1784. Today it is part of the Ruhunu Cultural Center. I'm interested in what looks like a water tower made of stone pictured behind the front of the market. I'm having a hard time finding information about it. I will just leave this picture here of it from the Google Earth Street View. I'm drawn to look into an area right next to Matara, now called Dondra, but historically called Devunuwara or Duwandara, an historic temple port town. It is said to mean God's city or God's port in the Sinhalese language. And indeed, one of the most celebrated religious sites of the island, with a thousand Hindu and Buddhist statues at one time, and the ruins of Hindu shrines and a Buddhist temple. Sri Lanka's tallest lighthouse is located here. It is 161 feet or 49 meters tall and said to have been designed and built by two English engineers starting in 1887, first lit in 1889, and opened in 1890. This picture was said to have been taken circa 1890. Now let's just take a picture of ourselves beside the lighthouse and no one will know the difference. Not only that, we're told that granite used in its construction was said to have come from Scotland and Cornwall, and the bricks and steel from England. I'm going to end this video here and pick up the alignment at Adams Peak in Sri Lanka in the next video.